So I'll start off then, and um, we are concerned first of all with the basic principle, the basic principle, uh, the basic test of causation in law, which is of course the but for test, uh, and the simple fact that if um, the claimant's injury or loss would have recovered in the absence of the defendant's negligence, then the claimant can't recover. Two very simple examples in the clinical negligence context. Uh, first of all, um, Barnett. Um, from 1969. Uh, this is a case where the claimant and his two colleagues attended a hospital um, having suffered arsenic poisoning at work. They attended hospital, complained of feeling ill and uh, that they'd been vomiting. Um, the casualty officer um, uh, didn't do his job, uh, didn't bother to examine them and said they should simply go home and see their GPs in the morning. Claimant died five hours later. Um, so about as clear a case of clinical negligence as you can possibly imagine, really. Unfortunately uh, for the claimants, uh, or rather the claimant's relatives, uh, the evidence was that prompt treatment at the time of attendance at hospital would not have saved his life, and therefore the claim fails on the simple application uh, of the but for test. Um, also relevant here is the so-called de minimis principle, if I can just be permitted a little bit of Latin. Um, and, that, and that the same outcome uh, uh, happens where there's no appreciable difference in the outcome uh, for the uh, claimant. An old case of Kerry against England provides a useful, um, uh, a useful um, example of this. Uh, the claimant's wife had flu and she wanted to take bismuth, which was then a remedy uh, or at least uh, uh, relieve the symptoms of flu. Uh, the pharmacist supplied the wrong substance. Um, the defendant company or the defendant had supplied a particular substance uh, and labelled it as bismuth, but in fact it wasn't. Uh, so a claim was brought against that defendant, uh, uh, rather reminiscent of the snail in the coke bottle. Uh, the claimant's wife sadly died and it was a jury trial. And the jury set found that the death of the claimant's wife from influenza had been accelerated, but not to any appreciable extent. They made no award of damages to the claimant, but did make an award of damages uh, to the claimant's uh, son. And the Privy Council said, well, causation is not made out there because uh, any, um, ex any, any kind of minor acceleration uh, would not be sufficient to establish causation. Um, the doctrine is, De minimis non curat lex, uh, the law is not concerned with trifles. So um, that's the basic principle and that's all uh, reasonably straightforward. Um, but um, as we know, uh, things are often more complicated than that. Um, uh, we often get cases where there are multiple possible causes uh, for, a, uh, for somebody's outcome. And um, in some of the cases, the evidence will be straightforward, but one cause is likely to be the cause of the claimant's injury or loss. For example, the evidence might show that, it's, uh, that the outcome is 70% likely to be cause, uh, attributed to cause A, only 20% to cause B and 10% to cause C. And the law then treats cause A of, as being uh, the cause. Uh, but it's often the case, perhaps usually the case, uh, that the medical evidence will not be so clear cut as that. Uh, and therefore, it won't be possible to say with confidence um, exactly uh, what the likelihood is of each cause uh, eventuating. So with the, the problems that we're concerned with are these. First of all, where there are multiple possible causes for the claimant's injury or loss, can the claimant succeed by demonstrating that the defendant's negligence was one such cause? And if so, in what circumstances? And these issues are, in my experience, a source of great confusion for clinical negligence practitioners. And as we shall see, the case law on the subject is not particularly clear. It doesn't speak with a consistent voice. What, in my view, is helpful however, is to go back to the first principles. And most of these principles have been worked out, not in the clinical negligence context, but in the context of industrial disease. And the courts have rejected any attempt to draw distinction to place clinical negligence cases in a particular category. It's helpful, I think, to remind ourselves of these basic cases uh, from industry, the industrial disease context, because they show the principles factually, perhaps in a rather more clear manner 
uh, than one gets from reading a lot of uh, decisions in clinical negligence cases. So Bonington, Castings and Ward Law, first of all, decision of the House of Lords from 1956, and uh, the claimant here contra uh, contracted pneumoconiosis from inhaling silica dust. Most of that dust came from pneumatic hammers in the factory where the claimant was working. And uh, the, that dust getting into the atmosphere did not involve a breach of duty by the defendant. However, some of the dust came from swing grinders and there was a statutory duty there to extract the dust uh, from the vicinity and the defendant had not done so, so it was in breach of duty. There is no exact evidence as to the proportions from where the dust came from, although it could be said uh, that generally more dust came from pneumatic hammers. But the House of Lords held uh, that, that it was sufficient that the claimant had demonstrated that some of the dust came from the swing grinders and it had made more than a minimal contribution to the total amount of dust in the atmosphere. So on that basis, the defendant would be liable. It's important to bear in mind uh, that the, def the defendant ran it as an all or nothing case. The defendant said, we are not liable for any proportion uh, of this um, disease that has been uh, contracted. Uh, we are not liable at all. That was the way in which the case was run. Uh, next up, we more recently, B against Ministry of Defence, um, case in uh, this decision in the Court of Appeal in 2010. Uh, the, claim, the claim was a rather ancient one. It was the claimants had developed cancer in the 50s uh, when they were uh, serving in the forces and being exposed to radiation um, during nuclear testing in the Pacific. The evidence showed uh, that their cancers were not divisible conditions. By divisible conditions, you mean one where the extent of the exposure increases the severity of the condition. Uh, you either get cancer or you don't. So it's, a divis it's an indivisible uh, condition. And uh, the Court of Appeal held that the Bonington Castings analysis was only applicable where the disease or condition was divisible and it could be said that the uh, defendant's tort increased the harm uh, to the claimant. And therefore, uh, these claims could not recover. Uh, the decision, the case did go to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court did not um, have to consider this particular issue. Um, the Supreme Court was concerned with limitation. Case of Hennigan um, in 2016. Uh, was a case of lung cancer consequent on asbestos exposure. Um, this followed the analysis of the Ministry of Defence uh, and recovery on a material damage basis uh, was only permitted where the court is satisfied on scientific evidence that the exposure for which the defendant is responsible has in fact contributed uh, to the injury. So uh, again, the same analysis uh, that you actually have to show um, a, a contribution. And then, the fi uh, and then, then there's Fairchild, uh, which is the well-known case in the House of Lords, um, on material contribution to the risk. Claimant developed mesothelioma caused by ex exposure to asbestos. Each of them had been exposed to asbestos in more than one employment, but not all of those employers were before the court. Um, the risk of mesothelioma it is known, increases with the amount of asbestos exposure, but the condition is an indivisible one, i.e. Uh, you get it, and the severity of the condition does not vary with the dose of asbestos to which you've been exposed. Now, in, the, in this particular circumstance, the House of Lords held that the but-for test should be relaxed so that the claimant can recover from the defendant as a result of a material increase in the risk of contracting a condition, even if they couldn't show a material contribution uh, to the onset of mesothelioma from the individual employer. And the final case in this context, the case of Holt uh, from 2000. Um, this again was an asbestos case. And um, the claimant had been exposed to asbestos dust over 40 years, working for the defendant company for about half that time. He developed asbestosis. Unlike mesothelioma, this is a divisible condition where the severity of the condition depends on the dose of asbestos. 
The claim had succeeded, but his damages were reduced by 25% to take account of the contribution of asbestos dust from the claimant's other employments. Uh, he appealed, but the Court of Appeal held it was the right approach. It was appropriate to reduce his damages to reflect a contribution by an exposure for which the defendant is not responsible. So that's all very well. And how, how has this been applied in the clinical negligence context? Well, the starting point, uh, I think, is Wilshire uh, in 1988, decision of the House of Lords. Uh, the claimant was a baby born prematurely. He had retrolental fibroplasia, which causes blindness. And um, he had a number of medical problems, as sadly is often the case with premature babies. Uh, and there are a number of possible causes amongst those uh, medical issues. Apnea, hypercarbia, interventricular hemorrhage, patent dust ductus arteriosus, which is a condition of the heart, hole in the heart, basically. Uh, and uh, those four conditions were simply a consequence of uh, the claimant's prematurity not anything the defendant had done wrong. However, during the process, uh, there had been excess oxygen administered negligently by the defendant. And um, the House of Lords held that the defendant did not add to the risk of injury, but merely added to the list of factors on the evidence which might have been the cause um, of his uh, brain injury. Uh, since the claimant must prove that the breach of duty was at least a contributory cause of harm, all that he proved was that the defendant had created another risk factor. So that very much turned on the particular evidence in that case, and causation was not made out. Next case, um, Bailey against the Ministry of Defence, decision of the Court of Appeal from 2008. And this tends to be the linchpin of claimant's arguments in relation to um, material contribution. The claimant had suffered a deterioration in his condition after surgery uh, to a bile duct. Uh, she had had a period of negligent care, but she also developed pancreatitis, um, and that hadn't been a result of negligence. The result of this was that she suffered from uh, very substantial weakness. And uh, while she was in hospital, she aspirated vomit and suffered hypoxic brain damage as a result. Um, the trial judge held the cause of her aspiration for vomit was her weakness and her body's inability to clear vomit by coughing uh, in the usual uh, way, to clear her airway. And um, the weakness was contributed to both by the pancreatitis and the lack of care. It wasn't possible to distinguish between those two factors in deciding the, uh, in establishing her weakness and therefore causation was established. Case of John from 2016, decision at first instance of Mr Justice Pickham. Claimant here suffered a brain injury after a head injury in a fall, brain damage rather, after a head injury in a fall. Uh, the, there was negligence in two respects. First of all, a six hour delay in carrying out a CT scan. And then secondly, a one hour delay in a transfer for surgery. It was held that the um, doctrine applies to multiple agency cases as well as to single agency cases. Uh, so in other, that was the defendant's argument that because um, there was uh, because that because there was only one um, cause, uh, there wasn't there's was more than one cause uh, in play. Uh, the doctrine simply had no application. What Mr. Justice Pickens said, where it was impossible as a matter of uh, as a matter of evidence to distinguish between uh, the competing causes of the injury rather than being merely difficult to do so you could not apportion the damage and the defendant would be liable for the whole uh, but that's quite an influential decision in terms of uh, when you can apportion and when the payment covers in full and then there's the decision of the Privy Council in Williams uh, from 2016. Not, of course, strictly binding in this country, but nevertheless very persuasive. It's a case of a negligent delay in diagnosing and treating a ruptured appendix, leading to complications after the uh, claimant underwent, underwent um, appendicectomy. And um, the 
claim it developed sepsis incrementally over a period of six hours, including a negligent delay of two hours and 20 minutes. Um, it was suggested uh, that, the, uh, that the delay merely contributed uh, to the onset of sepsis, but the, but the outcome was myocardial ischemia. And that was held on the evidence to be a continuous process um, of undergoing. Uh, and so, um, although on the face of it, it sounds like a similar case to Bailey, the Privy Council has adopted a slightly different analysis. They said, well, the principle is the defendant must take a claimant as he finds it. So in other words, um, that, uh, in, in other words, that the claimant has a ruptured appendix, uh, and therefore that's the starting point for the hospital, and, that, and the, claim, the defendant has to treat uh, the claim properly on that basis. So that basis was preferred. Uh, uh, to the contribution uh, analysis adopted in the Bailey case. So on the face of it, therefore, you've got a fairly wide doctrine. But I just want to draw attention uh, to uh, these two recent cases in which um, the judges have held uh, that the doctrine may in fact be more confined uh, than, than those cases on the face of them show. Davis against Finley Health NHS Foundation Trust decision of his own judge hour back in the high court claimant's wife here died from bacterial meningitis um, she'd arrived at hospital at 10 past nine in the morning no no intravenous antibiotics were given until 1 20 in the afternoon the evidence showed uh, that the claimant's wife would have survived if antibiotics had been given by 10 40 a.m and the judge in fact held on the evidence that causation was in fact established on the simple but for basis. However, the judge then went on to consider uh, whether the alternative case for the claim based on material contribution uh, could, uh, uh, be, uh, could, could be established or not. Uh, there's a very detailed consideration of the authorities uh, and three rules were set out in paragraph 200 of the judgment. First of all, where the harm is divisible, a party will be liable if their culpable conduct made a contribution to the harm to the extent of that contribution. Secondly, where the harm uh, is indivisible, a party will be liable for the whole of it if they caused it, applying but for principles. And then the third rule, if two wrongdoers have both together caused indivisible injury in respect to which it is impossible to apportion liability between them and each is co-liable for the whole of the injury suffered. Now the emphasis there is on two wrongdoers because uh, the judge went on to consider Bailey and Williams and said well there's no new principle established by those cases uh, and uh, concluded that material contribution would not have availed the claim uh, if they could not prove causation on a but-for basis and the reason for that uh, was it was a case of a single wrongdoer uh, with competing or, or competing causes um, arising uh, simply from the claimant's own situation and time, i.e. it was going to take uh, time uh, to administer the necessary treatment. Uh, and then finally, uh, in this review of the case law, we've got the case of Thorley, uh, even more recent decision uh, from this year. Uh, in this case, the claimant underwent a coronary angiogram to investigate chest pain. The claimant uh, was a, a stopped taking his warfarin for six days, three days before admission and three days after. Three days after uh, discharge, he suffered an ischemic stroke. His case was that they should only have stopped warfarin uh, for the three days. Stop warfarin in these circumstances because, of course, warfarin gives rise to a bleeding risk um, if you... Uh, undergo in, invasive uh, treatment. The hospital admitted that they should have restarted the warfarin on the day after discharge. So in other words, there would have been a four day break in the uh, claimant's treatment with warfarin. Now, um, sorry, there's just, there is in fact a slide missing there, my apologies. So I'll just um, uh, indicate uh, what the, uh, what should be there. Um, make sure that's added afterwards. Um, it was agreed uh, by the judge 
that the claimants, uh, by the parties, uh, that the claimant stroke was indivisible. The question was whether material contribution uh, would avail the claimant. And the judge again carried out a very detailed review of the authorities. Uh, this is at paragraphs 138 to 146, if anyone wants to take a note. And then uh, the judge concluded that applying strict precedent, the decisions in B against Ministry of Defence and Hennigan show that the material contribution doctrine does not apply where there is a single tort visa and an indivisible injury. So uh, if that's right, uh, and it's a decision at first instance, um, but nevertheless a decision that was necessary for the judge's uh, rejection of the claimant's case on contributory, um, uh, on material contribution. Uh, if that's right, that would tend to severely restrict uh, the availability of the doctrine the claimants uh, in clinical negligence cases. So um, obviously the important thing to consider um, is uh, whether is, is what conclusions we should be drawing um, in relation to uh, the law here. And um, the authorities are quite hard to reconcile, but as, as I've said, the most recent High Court decisions may severely limit the availability of the doctrine. In Thorley, the judge said that the area is, quote, right for authoritative review, um, and no one would disagree with that. Claimants will obviously argue for a wide application, the different analysis in Davis and Williams between them, establish applicability to cases of the single tort fees. The defendant can then argue on the basis of the recent decisions, there's no application in this situation. What is tolerably clear is the courts have shown no appetite for applying the Fairchild analysis and sidestepping this by saying that a material contribution to a risk is sufficient. That simply hasn't uh, been applied really outside the context of uh, industrial disease. So in terms of uh, preparing your evidence, um, what are the important questions uh, to ask your experts to consider? First of all, is the claimant's injury divisible um, or, or indivisible? Is it cumulative? Um, can, it, can you say that, for example, where there's a process going on, uh, that um, the, the stage had been reached of no return for the claimant? Or are you going to be uh, stuck uh, with the fact that it's really not possible to say as a, mat as a matter of science uh, what the uh, outcome for the claimant would have been in the absence of the defendant's negligence. So can you determine on the evidence what the claimant's state would have been in the absence of that negligence? And often uh, it's very important to go back to the basic records here because they may offer a clue, particularly in cases of delayed treatment, because you may find, for example, the nursing records clear indication of a particular state having been reached perhaps a neurological state, for example, in the case of uh, spinal problems or cardiopredia syndrome or something like that. Uh, and in some, case, in some conditions, there is uh, a well-known process as to the order in which events tend to occur. Cardiopredia is an example of that um, because it's known, for example, um, that things tend to happen in a particular order uh, when the syndrome uh, is ongoing. Uh, the other uh, thing to bear in mind is that uh, we don't award dam damages so much for um, an injury as the consequences of the injury. Uh, and therefore, the, uh, the different uh, heads of loss may actually require different answers in terms of whether uh, the causation is made out or not. So again, taking Carol Creener as an example, um, you can say, for example, that the claimant would have uh, in any event, um, suffered uh, from um, bowel and bladder symptoms, which often happen earlier uh, in the process, as I understand it, uh, but nevertheless would have avoided um, uh, being so badly restricted in their mobility. And that obviously may have different consequences for different heads of damage. So consider carefully uh, the, the different outcomes for the claimant and whether you may be required to give different answers in relation. Uh, to that. Uh, that, I hope, is a quick journey through uh, this. 
So what I'm now going to do is hand over to Lisa uh, so she can deal with the uh, different issue of psychiatric injury. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, I'm going to speak to you about material contribution to psychiatric injury. Um, and I start in much the same place where Paul started, um, which is first principles. And it takes us back to the precisely the same case that Paul started with, which is um, Bonington Castings Limited, 1956 House of Lords decision. And the first principles I have restated there, the employee must in all cases prove his case by the ordinary standard of proof in civil actions. He must make it appear at least that on a balance of probabilities the breach of duty caused or materially contributed to his injury and those principles apply as much to psychiatric injury as they do to any physical injury. Could I have the next pl uh, slide please Paul? Um, move forward 45 years and uh, we have the case of Hatton and Sutherland 2002 Court of Appeal decision um, and much like in with the physical injuries Paul looked at some of the industrial disease cases with the psychiatric injury and material contribution a lot of the cases arise from stress at work um, judgments and decisions and one example is Hatton and Sutherland um, and here uh, Lady Justice Hale as she then was um, provided some uh, obiter with regard to um, psychiatric injuries and material contribution and this is what was said many stress-related illnesses are likely to have a complex etiology with several different cases uh, causes that should be in principle a wrongdoer should pay only for that proportion of the harm suffered for which he by his wrongdoing is responsible hence if it is established that the constellation of symptoms suffered by the claimant stems from a number of different extrinsic causes then in our view a sensible attempt should be made to apportion liability accordingly there is no reason to distinguish these conditions from the chronological developments of industrial industrial disease or disabilities. So much like we've seen judicial commentary in uh, with physical injuries to say that actually you shouldn't put clinical negligence cases of material contribution into a separate context, here we have authority for the point that psychiatric injuries or material contribution to a psychiatric injury should not be put into some special category. The same principles apply, um, so you, the claimant still has the burden of establishing that on the balance of probabilities the breach did in some way materially contribute to the injury and then if the injury is divisible in some way then the uh, tort visa should only be responsible to pay for that portion which they have contributed to and what we mean by divisibility in this context is not the divisibility of the causes so we're not going back to look at all of the extrinsic causes and trying to divide between them but it is the divisibility of the actual injury can you um, apportion the injury can you look at the injury and break it down in some way to say that the tort visa should only be responsible for that part of it um, if I could have the next slide please Paul um, paragraphs 43 through to 45 of the judgment are very important. And I've set out here some of the principles that are set out at paragraph 43. Um, the three subparagraphs which relate to material contribution to psychiatric injury are paragraphs 14 through to 16. And this is what is said. The claimant must show that the breach of duty is caused or materially contributed to the harm suffered. First principles. It is not enough to show that just the stress itself has caused the harm. Um, and that's in the occupational uh, health stress context and par subparagraphs 15 and 16 which are most relevant here where the harm suffered has more than one cause the employee should only pay for that proportion of the harm suffered which is attributable to his wrongdoing unless the harm is truly indivisible and um, that's relevant for this reason these subparagraphs recognize that there will be some psychiatric injuries that are truly indivisible but it also recognises that there are some injuries, however you approach it on whatever kind of rough and ready basis, some psychiatric injuries are capable of being apportioned, they are divisible. And then the next subparagraph, the assessment of damages will take account of any pre-existing disorder of vulnerability and of the chance that the claimant would have succumbed to a stress-related disorder in any event. And in many respects, that's a kind of orthodox uh, causation point. Um, was the claimant so vulnerable that they were going to suffer the same psychiatric injury at some point in the future in any event? Um, this is often referred to in the kind of final straw type cases. There's a whole series of um, uh, issues that have arisen, some which might 
might be as a consequence of a breach, some which may not. And then there is a final straw moment which tips them over the edge. And that final straw moment can sometimes be seen um, as being quite a, a, a small issue in the context of all of the issues. And might that have occurred at some point in the future in any event. Another point to note about these is paragraphs 15 and 16 are not mutually exclusive. You may get some cases which has a, a few of the factors that you see from subparagraph 15 and a few of the factors seen from subparagraph 16. So you may be dealing with both of them in, in any one given case, so you may only be dealing with one. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, Paul. Um, to throw confusion into the matter, we then had the case of Dickens, um, Court of Appeal decision, uh, and again, over to remarks commenting upon the, um, the remarks made by Lady Justice Hale. Uh, uh, and paragraph 46 deals with this. I respectively wish to express my doubts as to the correctness of um, Lord, Lady Justice Hale's approach to apportionment. My provisional view, given without the benefit fit of argument, hence why this is obiter, in a case which has had to be decided on the basis that the tort has made a material contribution, but it's not scientifically possible to say how much that contribution is, apart from the assessment that it was more than de minimis, and where the injury to, to which that has led is indivisible, it would be inappropriate simply to apportion the damages across the board. It may well be appropriate to bear in mind that the claimant was psychiatrically vulnerable and might have suffered a breakdown at some point in the future, even without the tort. So that seems to be an, an acknowledgement that subparagraph 16 in Lady Justice Hale's decision in Hatton and Sutherland um, ha has good foundation. Um, but what uh, uh, Smith takes issue with in the case of Dickens is subparagraph 15, which is where you have a number of extrinsic causes that you should attempt to apportion those damages. And it says there may be some reduction in some heads of damage for future risk of non-tortious loss. But my provisional view is that there should not be any rule that the judge should apportion the damages across the board merely because one non-tortious cause has been in play. Um, and when one reads the case of Dickens, you see that the basis of this um, uh, uh, criticism or doubt is based upon the fact that Smith took the view that psychiatric injury was by its very nature indivisible. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please, Paul. The next case, um, BAE Systems, which is a Court of Appeal decision 2017, looks at this point uh, and tries to reconcile uh, where Hatton got to and where Dickens uh, reaches uh, and why there may be some difference between them and as far as there is a difference, which case is to be preferred. So if you're dealing with any case of material contribution to psychiatric injury, um, these are the three cases you need to be reading. Do go away and read the full judgments because they give you um, not just the principles, but actually some um, useful ways in which you can approach your evidence and the rough and ready ways in which you um, can try to apportion or break down uh, and divide the psychiatric injury. And what's said in BAE systems, I should say this is an employment tribunal case um, where there were a, a number of stresses at work followed by a comment made by a manager and that comment appears to have been the final straw, the tipping point, point of the claimant in that case where um, she then went off uh, sick. Um, BAE Systems gives some very useful guidance to both parties, claimants and defendants, as how they should be approaching their um, evidence and the facts in a case of material contribution to psychiatric injury. It is worth noting that whilst there is some um, uh, positives for defendants arising out of BAE systems. Uh, in that case, on the facts, it was actually ultimately decided that, um, that the injury was, was indivisible in that case and they weren't able to apportion it, not least because there were a number of extrinsic um, causes before the breach of, of the comment, the tipping point in the final straw, but there were also breaches which came after that point in time, which made the matter incredibly complex. But what BAE Systems tells us is this, the tribunal should try to identify a rational basis on which the harm suffered can be apportioned between a part caused by the employer's wrong and a part which is not so caused. The exercise is concerned not with the divisibility of the causative contribution, but with the divisibility of the harm. And that's an important point. I think sometimes you can fall down a rabbit hole when dealing with material contribution cases um, and try to remember that when you're looking at psychiatric 
psychiatric injury and you're talking about divisibility of the psychiatric injury, you're talking about the injury, the harm, can that be uh, divided, can that be apportioned? In other words, the question is whether the tribunal can identify, however broadly, a particular part of the suffering which is due to the wrong, not whether it can assess the degree to which the wrong caused the harm, because the latter dealing with the degree to which the wrong caused the harm is often not possible, which is why we have the doctrine of, um, or the principle of material contribution, um, but then apportioning the damages according to the extent to which it contributed to the injury, um, this recognises that in, in a, a lot of cases that will be possible and it is possible in psychiatric injury cases. If I could have um, the next slide please Paul. So reconciling the two, um, the difference is that um, uh, in, in the case of Dickens, it was believed that the psychiatric injury, the harm will always be indivisible, whereas the encouragement in Hatton to find a basis of apportionment where possible means that the court believed that the harm would be divisible at least sometimes. To the extent that there is a difference between the views expressed by um, Smith and Sedley in the case of Dickens versus what was said by Hale and Hatton, we should follow the latter. Um, so Hatton is uh, authoritative on that. And it will really come down to your facts and expert evidence, um, which takes me on to my next slide, which I think is really where the difficulty comes in psychiatric injury cases. Um, I can point to the principles and the case law, and uh, but the real difficulty comes when you are sitting down with your expert, whether it be writing instructions to your expert or you have them in conference, and really pulling together the evidence that will be able to tell you whether this is a divisible injury or not, and if so, how you can apportion it. And, and, and sometimes it is best to look at it from the perspective of um, what is indivisible. If you look at the examples of cases where injuries have been said to be indivisible, um, we have where there is a death, for instance, once the death has occurred, it has occurred, it's an indivisible injury. Um, mesothelioma cases, indivisible injuries, these are injuries which don't get worse according to the, the dose or the exposure. And those, the, the injuries, uh, stroke for instance, um, in, in the uh, cases that Paul was referring to, you will have some injuries that absolutely are indivisible. Um, with psychiatric injury cases, it is slightly more complex complex um, because it's very often the case that we're looking at potentially not just one diagnosis but a series of diagnoses um, and not just uh, uh, one or two uh, extrinsic causes but a whole range some of which might be um, some of which might be related to a breach and some of it which might not but really what the courts are looking for and what they expect from you and from the experts is to really um, uh, go through the facts and see if you can apportion it in any way which is possible. And the words used within the case law is any rough and ready or sensible approach to apportionment. So on my final two slides, I've set out some tips that you might want to use uh, when it comes to um, uh, going through your expert evidence. If I could just go back one slide, please, Paul, because this is the penultimate slide. Um, first tip, don't forget, but four, I talked about potentially falling down a rabbit hole when dealing with material contribution to psychiatric injury. But don't forget that you may, if, if, you're, if you're a defendant, then you might have an answer on a but four basis. Equally for a claimant, um, if material contribution has been raised by an, an expert, don't get sidetracked by it. Still go back and address the but four because um, you may face an argument from a, a defendant that um, defeats your case on a but four basis. So if the same injury would have occurred regardless, uh, of any breach, uh, then it's going to fail on, on that basis. As to material contribution, remember your first principles, the burden is upon the claimant, it's on the balance of probabilities, and the uh, breach or wrongdoing has to have be shown to, on the balance of probabilities, caused or materially contributed, so more than de minimis, um, to the psychiatric injury itself. And if I could have the next slide, please, Paul. Um, issues that you might want to approach with your expert, I think make your expert aware of um, their role and what they need to do here. Uh, 
remind them that the parties have been encouraged to make a sensible attempt to apportion, even if, even if it is on a rough and ready basis. It is concerned with the divisibility of the injury, not the divisibility of the causes. And there will be some cases that are truly indivisible. Um, that there is some authority under Hill um, in the BAE Systems case said that um, Hale in Hatton went so far as to say actually in the general run of cases most psychiatric injuries will be divisible um, and uh, so some would look at Hatton for authority that the vast majority of psychiatric injuries are capable of being apportioned in, in some way or another. But we know in practice, when it comes down to it, that can be very difficult. Um, so things that you might want to focus upon with your expert, is there a range of diagnoses? Um, if so, can one of those diagnoses be pinpointed to a point in time or to a particular event? And can the damages be apportioned in that way? Do any particular losses flow from a particular um, event that can be uh, attributed. So, for instance, the loss of earnings coming at a point, like in the case of BAE systems, where the claimant went off following the comment, um, can you see a trigger such as that? Percentage assessments, um, I think Paul used one of the examples um, where uh, uh, experts will be asked to put uh, percentage figures on um, uh, the different uh, the extent of the injury um, and you can encourage your experts to try and do that if they can although in my experience that is very tricky and difficult for them and they're often reluctant to do so because there's no scientific basis for it. Um, was there a psychiatric condition prior to the breach such that this is an aggravation? Again, this really comes back down to um, normal causation principles, but it's something that you have to explore because if you can um, identify a particular aggravation, then only that part will be compensatable by the tort visa. And then coming back to the final point, uh, was there a pre-existing vulnerability, which brings us back to um, Hale's subparagraph 16, which if there is a vulnerability, then it is upon the defendants um, to raise this point to suggest that um, the psychiatric injury would have unfolded at some point in the future in any event. Um, and, and that can be a very valuable argument that the defendants do have to raise and explore within their expert evidence. Um, that's a quick whistle-stop tour of uh, material contribution to psychiatric injury. Um, remember that there are no, um, it, it, it's, it's not a category on its own, same basic principles, but you will find those three cases that I have provided particularly useful when dealing with psychiatric injuries. I'm not sure if we have any questions or not, I'm just going back to look at the chat. No? Well, that means one of two things. Uh, either we've uh, explained everything so clearly that no one has any questions, or it means that no one understands a, a, a single word. <laughs> but, um, I'm, I'm hoping it's the former rather than the latter. Um, the slide on the screen now um, uh, contains our contact details, our email addresses. Uh, we are always very, very happy indeed to discuss on an informal basis with our solicitors um, any points uh, they may have in relation to this or indeed any anything else uh, so do please feel free to contact us uh, by telephone that's the clerk's number there and they'll obviously put you in touch with us or probably better by email uh, so that, that those are our details there and i just want to draw attention to our next webinar in our ongoing series um, that's on 24th of november uh, thursday week at 12 noon, uh, when Laura Johnson and Susanna Bennett will be discussing the important topic of capacity uh, in uh, the context of personal injury claims. Uh, please email the clerks for further information or to attend, and there will be a mail shop going out in the usual way, which will advertise uh, that webinar. And um, we've got a few things coming up in the chat, which I'll just have a look. Um, I think that's a few bouquets. Um, so uh, brickbats you can send um, uh, privately, if you don't mind. Uh, but obviously, any feedback is very welcome. We very much hope uh, that you found today useful. Uh, so uh, unless uh, it seems that no one uh, wishes to put, put any points to us at uh, this time, thank you all very much for attending, and we hope you found it useful. Thank you, everyone.